Our second scripture this, this morning comes from Mark chapter 1, uh, verses 1 through 8. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophet Isaiah. See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you who will pre prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locust and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Hey, Jan, I'm stealing your copy of the anthem, and I'll give it back. Thanks. So this sermon series in Advent, um, we're talking about the direction of our salvation. Um, and if the kids were here, they could help us out because, oh, Michaela is. Are you ready, Michaela? I know. What is Advent? And who are we waiting for? Excellent. And so we are waiting this season. And so part of waiting for Jesus to be born is also remembering that we are waiting for Christ's second return. And so as much as we understand um, that uh, our salvation and our journey of following Christ um, is about eternal life with God, that's actually not the end goal. That's not where the vision stops. Um, it is a step along that path, but the vision stops with Christ returning and heaven reigning on earth. So actually the final direction of our salvation is not us going away, but God coming to us. Think of the Lord's prayer that we just said of thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Over the last couple of weeks, we looked at a couple of scripture passages that talked about both heaven and earth passing away um, for this vision, for this shalom, for this whole peace to be born forever, for all eternity. And that's the final goal and the final vision. Um, and so as we come together, we're looking this season at what it means to wait for Christ and to wait for that vision to become reality. And so part of what that means is that we know the end of the story of Jesus, right? That there is a death, but there's also a resurrection. And so the theological terms for the times that we're here in now is called the already and the not yet, which is a bit messy because it's both and. It's already Christ has been raised the war is won, death is conquered, right? Every morning we come to recenter ourselves in that fact. Each Sunday gathering, we serve a living God who is at work to bring wholeness from brokenness and life from death because that completion, that battle is done and victory is ours. But just because that battle is complete doesn't mean that evil doesn't still have real sway. Just listen to the joys and concerns that we have raised this morning. There are still powers of evil and spiritual forces of wickedness and at work. And so it is also not yet because God's will is not yet done on earth as it is in heaven. We are still Advent waiting for Christ's second return for all the world to be as Christ envisions, with hope and peace and joy and love. And that's not just for the people of earth, but for earth itself, and as we care or don't care for her. One of the guiding ways of understanding this that I find that we talked about last week comes from our funeral liturgy in the United Methodist Church. We have a prayer that says, may we die as those who go forth to live, and may we live as those who are prepared to die, so that in our living or in our dying, we might witness to the love of Jesus Christ that nothing will separate us from that love, 
not life or death, not height, nor brokenness, nor any power or principality. I'm sorry, I'm messing up Romans chapter 8, so you're just going to have to get the Bible out and go to Romans chapter 8 versus, what is it, 30-something, 37, 39? All right, and, and then we'll get that verse together, and so I'll keep working on my journey to get my, my scripture and my soul better. Um, but the point is that in everything that we do, there is love at our center, and that nothing can separate us from that love. And so last week we talked about what it was like in preparing and in dying before Christ's return. And it was very much a comforting sermon, at least that was what I was hoping for it to be, um, and a sermon of care. Um, because um, as we also raised um, today, like there, this is a hard season. And just as the prophet Isaiah called out, comfort, oh comfort my people, so we want to be and offer that as well. But here's the thing from Isaiah. That call to comfort came after the Israelites were in exile. There was a call to repentance and some very, very striking and potent words before that comfort. And so part of following Jesus, part of being a disciple means that we are here to comfort the disturbed and to disturb the comfortable. That we are here to comfort those who are caught in the not yet of our world. We are called to bring furniture together and to bring hope for those who are in a midst of hopelessness. But it also means that we are here to bring disturbance for those who have gotten too comfortable it means that in our spiritual fruit that we talked about, there's self-control, where there will be moments where we will need to be called to repentance for putting our own needs way beyond and above anyone else's. And so we come to today where we're talking about living before Christ returns, which means this is my heads up. The focus of this sermon is going to be much more uncomfortable. As much as the prophet was there to cry out comfort for those in transition and caught in the not yet last week, the prophet is here to call out words of repentance through John the Baptist today for those of us who are in the living and in the already, but still being a part of those powers of evil and spiritual forces of wickedness that are bringing about the not yet brokenness. And so I've been asked... Um, also, um, in my pastorate, of why I talk about politics and church and why we can't just check that at the door and come and have a place of comfort. And this is why. Because there is a part of our world that is suffering from the not yet, that is caught in hopelessness. And so it isn't always going to be words of comfort because sometimes we are part of the problem that has caused that hopelessness. And so as John the Baptist calls people to repentance, that includes us as well. And the other piece is that politics isn't the dirty word that we've made it out to be. Politics happens whenever two people are gathered together because politics is the way that we design systems that care for one another. Sometimes those systems are really broken and don't work at all. And sometimes we strike the gold and hit it right. And we do have a way to care for each other and to care for people caught in hopeless situations. Partisanship is a totally different thing. But also, our journey has always been about politics. When we come to scripture today, we come to the words of Isaiah, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good tidings to the oppressed. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives. We're going to get into this more in Bible study in the week coming up, but this is jubilee language. This is language that was brought around an entire restructuring of the economic community of every 49 years, land going back to its original landowners, debts being erased so that the stratification that so naturally happens with us could be um, mediated and put under control. 
And then, and those are the words that Jesus quotes in the gospel according to Luke when he is starting his ministry. That's how Jesus centers himself and introduces himself as to who he is and what he is about. It was very political. And then we come to the gospel according to Mark, and we just gloss over this um, as the gospel according to Mark starts with the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And we're all like, yay, that's awesome. Um, But the good news was the inscription that was used in 9 BCE to announce the emperor Augustus' birth. The exact words used for the Roman emperor of the day is what this gospel writer uses to introduce a crucified Jewish rebel. And then, son of God, if you go back and look up on the internet any coins or images, the emperor is going to be there with Divius Filius, divine son. That was the claim that the emperor made. And so this is an incredibly political and jarring statement that this gospel opens with. And now in the words of uh, Christopher Hunt, um, Hudson, who is a New Testament professor um, at Hood Theological Seminary in North Carolina, I want you to imagine with me um, and go back to that first century when the gospel of Mark was written. So imagine that you live in Galilee around 70 CE. There's a war on. Some radical Jews have revolted against Rome, and Jerusalem is under siege. Reports are that the conditions in the city are bad. People are divided. Some see God raising up leaders to push the infidels from the Holy Land. Others urge submission to Rome as a path to peace and security. Everyone is anxious, caught between resentment of heavy-handed soldiers and fear of extremist guerrillas. Furthermore, Emperor Nero died last year, and there is unrest in Rome. Four men have been acclaimed emperor only to be assassinated, and now Vespasian, the very general besieging Jerusalem, has been crowned. What does this mean for the war? Things are uncertain. The price of oil is skyrocketing, olive oil, that is, and the world is in turmoil. Where do we look for the future? Your village population is mixed. Jews and Gentiles' intentions are high. Neighbors fear one another. Families fracture along ethnic lines. One small sect refuses to fight on either side. Followers of a Galilean rabbi named Jesus, who was crucified for insurrection about 40 years ago. Roman loyalists suspect them of continuing the alleged insurrection of their founder. The rabbis call them heretics, and the zealot rebels dismiss their founder as ineffective against Roman oppression. But you are intrigued by their claim that Jesus' crucifixion is a symbol of God's good news for Israel and for Rome. You ask, if this Jesus really was God's prophet, how is his execution good news for us? Someone hands you a scroll with a title scribbled on it, the beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. And then as you start reading, you come to John the Baptist. Because that title alone puts you, you're like, okay, I'm in Israel camp now and we're going to rail against the Roman Empire. But what opens this text but John the Baptist calling Israel to repentance. So what does that mean? The very core of who we are is about removing the log from our own eye before we remove the splinter from others. The very core of who we are is about recognizing the harm that not only others are doing, but that we are doing. The very core, the greatest commandments of scripture is to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourself. And in order to love our neighbor, we will have to engage not only in acts of mercy and giving what we have so that they may have homes and not just empty spaces, but it also means working in the policies of our government and of our systems to make it so that those needs aren't even present in the first place. 
And as we are called to love of God and love of neighbor and love of self, we are called to repent. And this is the three general rules. This is the basis of United Methodism, to do no harm, to do all the good we can, and to stay in love with God. Because we cannot tell anyone a story of salvation if we are harming them while we are trying to share good news of hope. We cannot even get to the point of witnessing and sharing good if we have created a night for them. Shadows fall around us and now we face the night. Hope and faith surround us. Soon will come the light. Will we prepare the way? Will we listen to John the Baptist's voice? And will we follow? Barry, our United Methodist Book of Resolutions and Discipline talks about how we are to engage in preparing the way um, through the social principles and through our political community. While our allegiance to God takes precedence over our allegiance to any state, we acknowledge the vital function of government as a principal vehicle for the ordering of society because we know ourselves to be responsible to God for social and political life, we declare the following relative to governments. We hold governments responsible for the protection of the rights of the people to free and fair elections, to the freedoms of speech, religion, assembly, communications, media, and petitions for redress of grievances without fear of reprisal, to the right to privacy, and to the guarantee of rights to adequate food, clothing, shelter, education, and health care. This is why we are politically active, so that we can share and work from these values. And the United Methodists call to political responsibility, that the strength of a political system depends on the full and willing participation of its citizens. The church should continually exert a strong ethical influence upon the state, supporting policies and programs deemed to be just and opposing policy and programs that are unjust. This is the journey that we are on together. And it's a messy one because we live in the already and the not yet. And sometimes we're going to see the not yet as already and we're going to see the already as not yet because we do not have full discernment. According to Paul in 1 Corinthians, we see now dimly as if in a mirror. But we still have to try. We still have to enter the messiness. And I'm going to close with a hard call. Um, in John the Baptist not mincing any words, um, here the United Methodist Church is very much wrestling. Um, and there will be um, a special general conference in 2019 to discern um, what we do around our policies and understandings of homosexuality. There are two places in our book of discipline that we say are incompatible with Christian teaching. War is one of them. We believe war is incompatible with the teachings and the example of Christ. We therefore reject war as an instrument of national foreign policy. The other place is that we affirm that all persons and are individuals of sacred worth created in the image of God, that all persons need the ministry of the church and their struggles for human fulfillment, as well as the spiritual and emotional care of a fellowship that enables reconciling relationships with God, with others, and with self. The United Methodist Church does not condone the practice of homosexuality and considers this practice incompatible with Christian teaching. Now, both go on to share um, in war in terms of there will be people um, who are pacifists for whom war is absolutely never an option as followers of Christ, and there will be followers of Christ who do see war as a needed last resort. Both of those are coming understanding of the already and not yet, right? So the people who are living into the already of Christ's resurrection are the pacifists who are saying, nope, this is not an option. Things have been won. We're fine. We live from this. And the people who do want to use war as the last resort are living from the 
Not yet, because evil is real, and we have to do something about it. And so there's openness on both sides. And again, for homosexuality, we call, they call the church, let me use the specific language, um, in terms that I read of everyone being of sacred worth, and that we implore families and churches not to reject or condemn lesbian and gay members and friends because we commit ourselves to be in ministry for and with all persons. The breakdown that comes um, is what we do then in the rest of our polity. Um, even though we call war incompatible with Christian teaching, um, we endorse military chaplains and um, there are, I have many colleagues who have become ordained. One of our past pastors um, here at Epworth has followed that path. My own alma mater, Wesley Theological Seminary, has a specific de de degree program for military chaplains. I am not here to say that that is not needed or not right because I do believe it is needed ministry and, and I am glad that we are there. But that is the way that we have dealt with this understanding of incompatibility with Christian teaching. And the way we have dealt with the understanding of incompatibility with Christian teaching with homosexuality is to ban those persons um, from ordination and to set in to motion possibilities for church trials. While persons set apart by the church for ordained ministry are subject to all the frailties of the human condition and the pressures of society, they are required to maintain the highest standards of holy living in the world. The practice of homosexuality is incompatible with Christian teaching. Therefore, self-avowed practicing homosexuals are not to be certified as candidates, ordained as ministers, or appointed to serve in the United Methodist Church. And... Ceremonies that celebrate homosexual union shall not be conducted by our ministers and shall not be conducted in our churches. And we have had trials of pastors who have, who have been defrocked and removed from ordination and removed from service. I share this to ask us the question of integrity, of how we are responding and how we are living where we can make room for nuance for one thing and have a commander in chief, the Clintons or United Methodists, but yet where we cannot leave room for another. I know that we see dimly and that we don't know fully, but I also know that there's a better way to love God and to love one another and to love ourselves. Because part of what we are called to as United Methodists is to do no harm. And unfortunately, we have done harm. Barry? One story as a campus minister that affected me deeply was a young black male who was in college. And he talked with me about an incident that had happened to him that he was still recovering from the trauma. And he, he was gay, and he talked to me about how he had, as a teenager, not too many years ago, been out with his youth group. And it was a predominantly white uh, church uh, group. And someone where they were started taunting him and calling him different names uh, based on them deciding that he was gay. And he said, look, I can't hide it. I can't pass. I just, people know I'm gay. Um, that's who I am. Just like they see I'm black. So just talk to me about how ultimately the more taunts he got, the more the youth he was with got upset and uneasy and that they, they all left and they left him and he was ultimately dragged out in the parking lot and beaten severely and had a very, very severe head injury and was in the hospital at, at in fact a couple of months. And it was just so powerful to me. Of course the hate crime was powerful, of course. But the bystander, what do we need to teach and preach 
is what I really wrestled with. The stigma of being with someone who's gay for heterosexual years could never be more than the, the Christian duty to stand with, to protect, to call 911 when the safety of that person is in jeopardy, let alone that they're being humiliated um, publicly. Um, that, that anyway, just how powerful um, the stigma, the ways in which churches stigmatize um, gay identity to the extent that not only does it impact those who are victimized by being ridiculed and sometimes injured and hurt, but how much we create a community and we raise generations of people that, in my view, lose a little bit of their, of their humanity, of their capacity to express Christian love. What do I need to change in myself so that I can allow God's transformation to be present in me and in the world around me? What do we as Epworth United Methodist Church, as the United Methodist Church, need to change in order to make room for God's transformation in us and then through us into the world? This is the question that John the Baptist raises as he calls us to prepare the way for Emmanuel, for God with us. I know that these are hard conversations and hard questions and hard words, so I hope that you will join us on Thursdays. Uh, this Thursday we'll be talking more, um, and if you can't on Thursday, give me or Pastor Bill a call, um, and we'll be happy to continue to be in conversation with you. May we pray and may we open our hearts to however God is calling us as God comes to be with us.